Hello and welcome everyone to Tuesdays at 7, brought to you by the International Contemporary Ensemble. My name is David Birdmarrow. I'm the hornist for the group. Uh, and it's my pleasure to present to you um, my little pocket program uh, for this Tuesday. Um, Tuesdays at 7 is an opportunity for the group to connect with uh, our audience, uh, which is why I want to start off by thanking you for tuning in. Um, it means the world to us. And um, despite these circumstances, we're very thrilled to be bringing this to you and still be able to bring this to you. Um, so uh, grab your cocktails or mocktails and uh, prepare for what I hope uh, will be a nice little uh, variety of works for solo French horn. Um, I'd also like to thank the production crew They've been amazing for me through this entire process. Uh, Ross, Machi, Bridget, you guys are wonder workers, and um, I'm really proud of what we've uh, put together tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank um, our creators tonight, uh, to Jerome Nolet, uh, for allowing me the use and the license of this piece and being very generous in, uh, in just communication with him, even though we've never met. Um, Paul, it's been great getting to know you, and we'll talk a little bit later in the program. Um, but I'm very happy uh, to to come together and and make this happen. And uh, also like to thank uh, Kayla Gome Webster, um, uh, who whose paintings are setting the stage. You'll see them behind me um, for this tonight's concert. Um, I'll do a little bit more explaining later as to why, but um, thank you so much, Kayla, and uh, um, it's it's going to be great. Okay, so getting to the program, uh, the first piece you're going to hear tonight is uh, by Jerome Nolet. He's a Paris-born uh, composer. Jerome was the uh, founding trombonist of the Ensemble Intercontemporain with uh, Pierre Boulez in 1976. And um, I never really, uh, you know, knew of him, um, but I happened to be in Amsterdam uh, and near the conservatory, and I was shopping for music. And this was right around the time, uh, because of a lot of my colleagues at the International Contemporary Ensemble and beyond, uh, being in New York, I've been around a lot of people who had this power of being able to walk on stage with nothing but their instrument and give a show. And I really, this was unfamiliar to me at the time, and I, and I really was enamored by it. Um, and so when I was there uh, in Amsterdam, I saw that there was a section for solo horn. It's something that I'd never seen before. Um, so I, um, I bought as much as I could. I think I recently uh, got a credit card, <laughs> my first credit card at that uh, time. So whoops. And um, I, uh, I brought back as much as I could. And Mirror, or Miroir, uh, was part of that collection. And I started working on it, and I became really um, enamored with it. I thought it was, I think it's a really great piece. Although I've never, I've only been able to perform it about one and a half times. Because the first time was, uh, I say one and a half, because the first time was about a little bit over a decade ago at another international contemporary ensemble uh, shows when we had a residency at the tank, 
uh, in New York City. Um, and again, just for um, a behind the scenes uh, audition that I that I had to make. Um, so I, I haven't really talked to very many people, uh, let alone horn players who know the piece, and I just wanna get it out there. So this is my opportunity to present this work to you guys. Uh, it's about seven and a half minutes long, and it's just a uh, bare bones French horn. So uh, allow me to prevent, uh, present the first piece in tonight's program, Miroir by Jerome Nollet. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Welcome back. If you just tuned in, that was Miroir by Jerome Nolet uh, for solo horn, horn alone. Um, moving on in our program, uh, some of you might be wondering um, why the paintings? Um, well, in fact, you're not alone. Even Kayla herself <laughs> wasn't really quite sure uh, what was going on when I first reached out to her. Uh, randomly, who is this random horn player who wanted to use her paintings as a setting. Um, but the story goes, uh, this summer, um, I think uh, it was it was firmly sort of imprinted in my, my head, I think, and in my mind and my memory. And I think it will be for, for almost everyone. And um, I was lucky enough this summer uh, to have a place to go uh, that was was still safe. And the University of Denver, the Lamont School allowed me to use my studio, my office here to work, um, which I'm incredibly grateful to them for. And on my way, pretty much every day, uh, I would walk and I would stop and get coffee at uh, uh, Kaladi, which is our, our local campus coffee roasters. A shout out to Kaladi. Um, and they uh, they do artist residencies. It's a really cool thing that I think basically should happen almost everywhere. Why not? Um, and this summer, during that time that was so memorable to us, um, Kayla was in residence. So basically every day um, I would come in and spend time with her paintings. 
And uh, while I couldn't purchase them, I wanted to figure out a way to acknowledge her and acknowledge her, her, you know, uh, just kind of place in in my life, and I'm sure in many other people who, you know, of the few places that we could go to, um, went and got coffee there, trying to to maintain some semblance of a routine. Um, so I reached out to Kayla, and she was she was very gracious. And I asked her to provide a painting, one for each of the works that you're going to hear tonight. Um, so that's the story of the paintings. So th thank you very much um, to Kayla. You will see in between the the uh, the next two pieces a short Zoom interview uh, because Kayla couldn't be here with us live tonight. Um, and uh, it will explain a little bit more in depth uh, who she is and what she does. So the music that's coming up next, um, going along with sort of the culmination of this summer, um, I spent some time going into a place that I had never really, you know, with the intent of actually having it performed, gone to, which is uh, writing music. Um, and I decided that I wanted to create something that was uh, kind of a place for student horn players to go and practice the the strange things that we all kind of know we can do when we mess around on our horns and on our in our own instruments, but you know uh, perhaps compose aren't that widespread knowledge amongst composers, or maybe it's just not asked for that often, and then all of a sudden you have to do them. And so I decided to start on a set of works for this purpose. And so each of these um, meditations is what I'm calling them, uh, aside from etudes, because I did write them with the intent that they would be performed. Um, each of them tries to focus on a different uh, aspect, uh, a different, different uh, little kind of kind of trick that we can do. So the first meditation that you're going to hear is uh, is a meditation that I. I in, in lieu of a name, I'm calling it more of a dancing meditation. And um, it's not an all out break dance. It's more of like a central kind of, uh, I don't know, um, uh, I don't know, siren dance or something. I don't know. I don't want to put too many thoughts in your head, but something like that. And that what that meditation focuses on is the melodic use of the harmonic system uh, on the horn. So instead of just the glissandi that you're used to hearing with the French horn, where we do hit all the partials of the harmonic series, we're using them melodically. And we're trying to take advantage of these, these uh, small intervallic shifts. Um, after that, you'll, you'll hear the uh, Zoom interview with Kayla. And then you'll hear the second meditation, which is simply a, an exercise in uh, vocal multiphonics with the horn. Um, I wrote it as kind of a, uh, a chorale with myself and it ended up being kind of like, um, you know, between the, the harmonies I chose and the, the beating of my voice and the horn somewhere between Bruckner and, uh, Lucier. <laughs> so whatever that means to you, um, <laughs> that's kind of where it ended up. So without further, further ado, um, here is the uh, first meditation, uh, Kayla's interview, and the second meditation. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
First year tattooer um, apprentice and pretty recently made the transition to full time. Actually, can kind of credit uh, COVID with making the transition to full time because I was doing that and working in a restaurant and finishing up my graduate thesis. And um, COVID happened and quarantine happened, and it kind of pushed me to get away from restaurants, get my thesis done, and started doing the tattooing full time. But I've been an artist forever. I was doing some freelance illustration work on the side and I like prior to tattooing and a lot of my own personal projects. My undergraduate degree is a double major in studio art and art history and my graduate degree uh, at University of Denver um, is an MA in art history with an emphasis on pre-Columbian burial art, specifically in moche erotic skeletal ceramics. Okay, so now, <laughs> but but you know it kind of makes sense, uh, you know, with your with your painting style, um, thematically aligned. Yeah. The one I have up right now is for uh, Paul Lianco's piece, uh, Reactor, which I've I've been recording. Um, but the other three are, you know, skeleton. They're skull. You know, they're they're yeah. they're skeletal. So um, it kind of it kind of makes sense. First and foremost, with my art, I do consider myself more of an aestheticist. Like I focus more on the imagery and what imagery I find intriguing or think will be impactful more so than an underlying meaning. I prefer to construct things that I think a viewer will be able to read their own meaning into or interpret in their own way rather than starting with an idea like a, a theme and like a concrete visualizing it yeah, yeah it, it, the visuals come first and meaning comes later uh, a lot of my work takes inspiration from graphic novel styles and imagery um uh, aesthetically that's one of my main influences and then thematically i look toward horror and humor and the intersection of those genres um so a lot of my work is just sort of it, at first glance, the imagery is either very bright and bubbly and cartoony, or it's very dark. But the it, when you like look more into it or read more into it, I like there to be an element of whatever the opposing side of that coin is. Exactly. Definitely, definitely get that in your paintings. You know, like the there's definitely a, a humorous side to the the. Uh, the skeletal sort of existential yeah. thing going on for sure, like laughing in the face of death. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't want to overanalyze, you know. Your well, no, I mean, I think that's definitely a valid interpretation. I mean, I, I, um, I think there's something to be said for looking at anything taking, I mean, it, imagery involving like death and the body and putting it in a lighthearted context. Um, I think it's very timely right now. I think there are a lot of artists out there playing off of themes similar to that, um, which I love. I think there's a bigger conversation going around in the art world in general, very specifically in tattooing. I think things like get in the air and everyone, I mean, not just COVID, but concepts <laughs> and people start to like, pull from those things and work off of each other. Um, yeah, even in work like the one behind you right now, it's an image that, you know, it's bright poppy colors. It's a beautiful woman, it's bubbles, it's bright, but then like it's a disembodied head of a woman. It's melting, it's disconnected. The, like her facial expression is vacant. Like, I, so I'm sort of 
Well, yeah, I guess it is somewhere kind of... between these things. I think that tattooing is starting to be more and more recognized, at least within certain circles, as a legitimate art form as well as a trade. Um, and that's where I see my work going, at least for the next few years. Uh, it's hugely popular right now. Like I, 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 I think it's probably more popular than it's than it's been. You know, it, it's becoming. It, it's very popular. It's very popular in certain places. Denver is a really good city for it. And as it's becoming more and more socially accepted, its popularity is definitely increasing. And I guess the other way around as well as it's becoming more popular, it's becoming more socially accepted. Um, but I mean, other than that, I certainly I. I want to make comics. I took a year off between undergrad and grad school to uh, write and illustrate a 120 page graphic novel that is sitting in a drawer um, and I haven't done anything with. And I would at some juncture like to re-approach that and re-approach making comics, but I will always be, you know, painting and drawing and trying to show my work when and wherever possible. And welcome back. If you just tuned in, that was my singing meditation uh, for solo horn. Um, and also, I just want to thank again Kayla Gome Webster uh, for allowing the use of her paintings. Again, um, no titles to the paintings, or at least not yet. Um, and uh, if you are in the Denver area or close, you can find her at Kitchens Inc. Kitchens Inc. Tattooing, um, where she is starting what looks like for, for one year in tattooing, she has quite a, a large amount of work at this point. Um, and you can also go to her, um, her Instagram at, I believe, KGW Illustration. I have to make sure that is correct. 
Moving on to our last piece tonight, uh, the piece de resistance. I've been waiting for this for, uh, let's see, yeah, 16 months. And it's finally here. And I'm so, I have so much gratitude to Paul Wianco for writing me a piece for uh, Solo Horn. Um, Paul graciously accepted when, similarly to the way I reached out to Kayla, I reached out to Paul. I was like, hey, Paul, write me a piece. And um, I, I don't know if it took him by surprise, uh, but um, we've grown closer because of it. And I keep finding myself thinking I need more Paul in my life. Um, and so here's to, you know, that result and more of this. Oh, I'll careful what so you wish for. <laughs> no, really, thank you so much for taking up this project. Um, and and it's it's uh, it's born such beautiful results. So so thank oh. you, thank you, thank you. My um, pleasure. So before we get to the piece, uh, let's just talk about it a little bit. Um, I want to talk about you uh, first. So, you know, I'm still learning more and more about you, but one of the things I realized I didn't know was uh, when, so I know, I know you as a cellist first. Um, and I was wondering like, when did you actually start composing? Um, let's see, it's been a, a while now. Uh, I guess I wrote my first real piece in maybe 2009, 2010. Um, but up, up until like the age of whatever my late twenties, uh, composition and improvisation and recording and, you know, making crazy sounds were all kind of lumped into the same category as just hobby things that I do when I should be practicing. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, uh, I guess it was when the Parker String Quartet asked me to write a piece. Um, that was right after I, I left the Harlem Quartet, who I played with uh, for three seasons. Um, and they asked me to write a piece for them. And hearing them premiere it, something just switched in my brain chemistry. And I just thought, I ha in addition to performing cello, I have to compose music for the rest of my life. And so you caught the bug. Oh, hardcore. <laughs> well, um, you know, over the last few years, I've learned more uh, about you and become become a fan of your music and um, did kind of the fanboy thing last year and just reached out to you. And um, <laughs> and so um, this this is your first piece for solo brass instrument, if I'm, I'm not uh, mistaken, right? Yes. Yeah, and so um, a large undertaking. And speaking of, you know, the fruits that this is, is bearing, um, we sat down uh, over a year ago for an hour and just walked through as much as I could talk to you about what the horn can do. And, you know, at the time I was just like thinking of it as, as you know, okay, yeah, sure, that's something like that we should do. But you recorded it and it's become quite the resource for young composers that have that I've worked with, um, and so you know, just making me do that it was you know, <laughs> uh, besides the fact that you you know you created the first of what I hope is many uh, works for for horn and for other brass instruments. Oh, that's amazing to hear. Actually, you know, I've started this piece for you so many times. And it has taken a completely different form every time. And you know, we've met actually twice. I don't know if you remember. You came back over, and I recorded you for another like two hours until you were literally lightheaded from me forcing you to make <laughs> air like air sounds for like way longer than anyone should ever. You're like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you kept. It was amazing. I have that all recorded, and. Uh, I mean, suffice it to say, none of that made it into the actual final <laughs> piece that I wrote for you. But I have like six other horn pieces in the making. Oh wow! Um, that's that that um, you will see someday for sure. Yeah, I think I must have passed out because I don't remember that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so awesome. So 
Um, I'm assuming you've used uh, delay before in your com composition and in your improvisation. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if you could talk a little bit about the way you can conceive of using delay in composition and for this piece. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, delay was one of my, my toys in my previous life, I call it. Um, so this is the first time that I've used it in a real piece. Uh, but it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. Instead of um, using delay as just kind of an effect that you put on a sound, to treat it as a way to play chamber music with yourself. And I had no idea when I was writing this for you how, like, apropos that would be at this during this time to like be able to play chamber music. <laughs> no kidding. You know, while <laughs> before crying yourself to sleep by yourself in quarantine. <laughs> but it's. I hope that comes in handy for you someday. Um, so this, yeah, this piece um, is basically, the, the reason it's called reactor is because, you know, you're reacting to one second, two second, three second, four second, year old, uh, four second old versions of yourself, um, ideally. Uh, so it has a kind of canonic, all the harmonies are canonic. It's not just kind of like, Hey, echo, echo, echo. You know, hopefully right, right, it's, right, right, right. has the feel of an actual, you know, quartet, quintet, sextet. Yeah. Yeah, it, it wasn't, you know, I have to admit it wasn't clear to me at first because when I was learning it, I wasn't learning it with the, the echo. I was just trying to get the notes under my fingers, you know. And then once I had it up to speed and put the echo in, I was like, oh, I have to actually play with myself. I have to... <laughs> I mean, you know, for lack of a better word, like I have to react or else I'm on time and things fall apart. So, um, so it was very apropos. Exactly. Um, and um, it was really fun to work on. So, um, so thank you so much. I think, uh, you know, students here probably walking through the halls and hearing me working on it was like wondering what is going on in that room for the past <laughs> month and a half. <laughs> right. Um, but um, but yeah, it was really just a pleasure, and we have a world premiere. Woo! And so um, yeah, I'm excited. I couldn't sleep last night, um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm I'm really stoked. Um, you know, nobody's heard it, and not even Paul. So brace in, Paul, buckle in, Paul, and uh, everyone. Allow me to uh, present reactor for solo horn and delay by Paul Wianco. Thank <laughs> you. 
That was the world premiere of Reactor by Paul Wianco for Solo Horn and Delay. Thank you so much again to Paul for the piece. Um, I, I'm so glad to have it uh, be part of uh, part of our library. Um, thanks for for horn players to choose from and add even more depth um, to an ever growing catalog. Um, so that's our concert for tonight. I want to invite everyone to a post-show Zoom. Um, there's gonna be a chat in, or there's gonna be a link in your chat right there. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then we, we, if you have any questions, we can talk more, um, you know, lodge any complaints um, and, uh, or just uh, chill out with me and uh, Paul for a little bit and, and, uh, and have some small chat. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank uh, you, the viewers. If you have any friends or if you missed any part of this, this will be uh, online at some point soon. Um, you can look to either my website, which is davidbirdbarrow.com, or the website of the International Contemporary Ensemble, which is I-C-E-O-R-G dot O-R-G. Um, thanks to the production team again. You guys are rock stars. And uh, thanks to Jerome Nolay, Paul Bianco, and Kayla Gome Webster uh, for your additions, invaluable additions to tonight's program. 
Thank you all, and I hope to see uh, see you again soon, if not in the Zoom chat. My name is David Birdmarrow. Uh, muchas gracias. <laughs>